Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. See ebaymotors.com. Every team, every topic, everywhere, this is Believe. Welcome in to another edition of the JMU Sports News Podcast. I'm Bennett Conlon, joined by Jack Fitzpatrick, a.k.a. Mark Freeman, interviewer. A.k.a. once fouled out of an intramural basketball game. We've all been there before. We have. Your your lower thirds were some of my favorite ones. Interviewing Christopher Fitzgerald over on our YouTube, lower third, defensive mm-hmm. tackle transfer. Your lower third, Ren, Bennett Conlon, not a defensive tackle. I could hang in there. I feel like scrap in with some heart. You can get me in there. You get me teaching. At what? Me. At what? 150? Yeah, I could hang in there, I think. It's more about I, the the, what is it? the drive the, and the desire fight and the, the heart. Fight the, dog the dog in you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what else is all about the dog? Bet online. It's Are your you? number one source for all of your summer sports this season from MLB, golf, NBA, and NHL. All the latest stats, news, and scores available to follow your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet online where the game starts. All right, so where do we want to start this episode? Doug Gottlieb going to Green Bay. We could go Richmond fleeing the CAA in football only. Or we could talk maybe JMU men's basketball. You you tell me where you want to go. I got I got stuff prepared for all three of those topics. Doug Gottlieb, I was surprised. You see, he's still doing his radio show too. Yeah, it doesn't seem. I don't think that's going to work out very well. Imagine if Deion Sanders went to coach Jackson State and continued being a media member. It'd be pretty wild. Yeah. I'd, how often <laughs> is his radio show? I think it's daily for two hours. That feels like a miss on his end. What what I'm really excited for is like he starts bashing his players in the media. That'd be sweet. I would like that if he just goes on and talks talks, talks smack about his guys for two hours on Fox Sports. <laughs> on national Fox Sports Radio. All right. So Jim Smith, our point guard we got coming in for Green Bay next year is a real difference maker. Doug, no one knows what you're talking about. Yeah, pretty wild. Also wild. Baseball boys canceled mid game today. Canceled is, mid game? Yeah, that's um canceled? <laughs> weren't they leading? They were up to nothing the last time that's I checked. Brutal. <laughs> that's absolutely brutal. A little breaking news here. Well, so I guess oh we'll lead God. it with bubble watch. How does this impact JMU's bubble case? Because they didn't uh. sweep Marshall. They won two of three against the Thundering Herd. But a loss against a 200th yeah. RPI team, not good for your RPI. You needed this win, and then maybe it, uh, you needed this win, and honestly, a Troy win on the road. Do you have to win the series at Troy now to like make make it into the uh, NCAA? I feel like tournament? you got to get at least one. Not sweeping Marshall was tough after getting the first two. They're down to 47th in the RPI. Yeah, that's Last bubble. Checked, like that is fringe bubble now. A couple weeks ago, they were like 27th. That's a I can, brute, like that was one of the things that was really their case was hey our RPI is phenomenal it's not right now it's that it's hurts. scary and you had to take an early lead on Virginia Tech and then get rained out and canceled is uh, and it's not getting made up that's that's very unfortunate can I run something by you yeah I'm shocked Virginia Tech was okay with canceling it. They're also bubbly. Is that right? They're 55 in the RPI. So this is a, this would have been a, a good win for Virginia tech. Yeah. 
So I'm, I'm kind of shocked that the Hokies, maybe because they got down early, yeah, they're yeah, like, ah, yeah, it's over, guys. <laughs> so remaining on the schedule is just three quad one games. Troy currently 48th in RPI, JMU 47th in RPI. And you mentioned it. They ranked as high as 26th yeah. in the RPI earlier this month mm-hmm. on May 2nd. Since then, they've gone 37th, 37th, 39th, 39th, 39th. 39th and then losing to Marshall dropped him to 47th. You'd love to at least get one against Troy. If you can win the series, it's huge. But yeah, that's a it's a little bit of a bummer for the bubble hopes that uh, you win a series against Marshall, you win a series against Arkansas State, but you don't sweep them and you take a dive in the RPI. 47th is their lowest ranking in the RPI since the very first RPI of the season when they were 49th. Huh. That's tough. Yeah. Peaking as high as ninth in the RPI on March 17th. It's brutal, man. And now, yeah, it's at Troy. And this is a team that has struggled mightily on the road. Seven and 14 in road games. So that's tough. Yeah. You take a sweep there and uh, would they be 30 and 23 too? They would be 31 and 23. Did they get to 31? I thought they they're only at, hit 30, 30 and then lost. At, yeah, so if they had swept them. I thought that would have given them 31. Yeah. So they're at 30. They're at 30 wins currently. I don't know if I completely understand your question. I thought you were saying 31 wins. If they had swept Marshall. But it's at 30. Yeah, so if they lose okay, the three. Okay, that was if, the most confusing conversation. <laughs> I was just mishearing you. If they lose three. They would be have 30 wins and 23 losses. Oh, oh, oh. Which is I see that what you were saying. Sexy. Yes. And maybe you've got an RPI outside the top 50. I don't know if that gets it done. I thought going into the Marshall series, I was like, they're right there. They're gonna do this thing. Losing the Virginia Tech game sucks. Not sweeping Marshall. Like, I don't want to say it's a nightmare scenario through four games. No, it's a nightmare scenario. Because even adding Virginia Tech as like a road game probably wouldn't hurt you. But even if anything, it even like keeps your strength schedule tasty. That's just uh, uh, it was really a win win opportunity. You either like have a tough road game that you lose, or you go grab a nice road win against Virginia Tech and sweep them on the season. So that is tough. Yeah. So as as things are shaking out now, they're fifteen and twelve in conference. Mm-hmm. They're going to have to go on a run in the conference tournament to likely make the NCAA regional round, because I don't foresee them sweeping Troy on the road or winning yeah, that either. series. Sorry. It's a nightmare scenario. You can say it. It's a nightmare scenario. It's a bit of a nightmare scenario. If you had swept Marshall, I tr- I truly believe if you had swept Marshall, you would have been able to win one of your last four games and make it in. Big series against Troy. Now you have to win two of your final three. It would have been two of your final four, in my opinion. But now with that Virginia, t- that's tough. That's some breaking news that really, really makes the bubble nearly pop especially uh yeah to have a lead against virginia tech early in that (laughs) one and then have it canceled is really brutal i guess there was no open i mean the the rain's letting up here in 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 virginia in charlotte yeah we've got some rain still coming down here just outside dc and maryland who knows blacksburg must be yucky or virginia tech is like look or virginia tech's a bunch of this yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> that's right. All right, so that's bubble talk. That's bubble watch. Let's take it on over to Jamie men's basketball. Because since the last time that we read tweets aloud here mm-hmm. on the podcast, some big news has come in. They got your boy, our boy, our, Mark Freeman. Boy at this point, everyone's boy, Mark Freeman. He did not, in fact, release a top three. I did. I did ask him about that. So you can check out a full length exclusive interview we have with Mark Freeman over on our YouTube. Uh, it's about 10, 10, 12 minutes, something like that. And it's really insightful because that was the opening question I asked him. I said, Mark, what's your definition of soon? And he laughed and he was kind of joking. And he was saying that uh, 
he kind of had his mind made up the entire time, but was just trying to figure some stuff out. And so it just kept pushing it back, pushing it back. And, and he did say at the end of it, he, he said, uh, every time that he posted decision coming soon or top three or something like that, he said he noticed the JMU fans in his mentions and he really they felt were. the love. And I was like, yeah, they were all over your mentions, man. They were, it was like six or seven replies deep. They were, they were, JMU fans were locked in on Mark Freeman for a long, long time. And it's, I think, as you said in a video, breaking it down before you interviewed Mark, sort of the final piece to the puzzle for the roster next year. Yeah, and Mark Freeman was like the first visit Preston Spradlin had after becoming head coach. And it was one of the first visits, I think it was the very first visit Mark Freeman took. He said when he stepped on campus, he knew he wanted to follow Spradlin. He said that was about 90% of the decision. Mm -hmm. He knew he wanted to follow Spradlin. He stepped on campus. He felt he, he loved it. He thought it looked beautiful. You know, what, what every, what every athlete and every student says. And then he had to go on his remaining visits, which was a reason it, it kept pushing the decision back. I think he ended up visiting Auburn. Uh, you, I think USC, uh, Vandy, so, some big high profile power five, high major big time schools. And that's what kept pushing it back. But it seemed like from the jump, Preston Spradlin was developing this roster, was creating this roster in the transfer portal, seemingly with the point guard of Mark Freeman in mind. Do you feel that same way? Maybe the addition of Luke Anderson took some of the onus on a Mark Freeman transfer decision away. Maybe the addition of Bryce Lindsey, the Texas A&M sophomore guard or redshirt freshman guard, took a little bit of that pressure away because Spradlin may have felt that Freeman may have potentially started to lean elsewhere. But at the end of the day, I was looking at the roster and you got, you got dominant or potentially dominant bigs in the Sun Belt, two power five guys, Luke Anderson, who isn't necessarily a guy who's going to bring it up the court and be your primary ball handler, but great off the catch and shoot can really fill it up, be a really solid score when he's not being doubled. Freeman really just seems to open it all up. Yeah, they needed like a bucket getter, and they got a guy who's proven in this system he can go get buckets. I think Spradlin bringing him in also means that he thinks he can play defense at a high level because that's important to him. It seems like a perfect fit. You kind of have your guy who can go get you a bunch of points, but you also then have a bunch of other guys around him who are capable scorers, capable defenders. I don't know if it's quite as good as last year's group, but it's kind of in that in that realm where I, I don't know, like if, if it comes together, I think that's the thing that is the biggest question because there's so many incoming transfer pieces, but if it clicks together, I think they could have a similar year in terms of winning a Sunbelt championship and then winning an NCAA tournament game, or maybe even multiple games. Like I think they would go to go into next year. as like a, you're a top 100 team. And the goal is to make the big dance again, which is crazy based off of what they lost. You kind of touched on it. A lot of JMU fans throwing around that this this team might be better than last year's team. You don't think that? You can make the case. I would listen to that. I think a lot of it is like projection, though. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, they got these two power five bigs who, even though they weren't like putting up crazy numbers in the power five, played a little bit, dominate the Sun Belt. Justin Taylor comes in from Syracuse. He takes a leap. AJ Smith is a proven scorer at Southern Indiana. Ricks takes a step at power forward. Luke Anderson, who did struggle at, at D1 stops previously, um, but balled out at D2 and seems like he's improved his game a lot. He comes in and he balls. Maybe Bryce Lindsay is the dog. Mark Freeman is a dog. Like there's in the offseason, it's easy to convince yourself that teams like unbelievable. And I think they could be. It's just I, you need to actually see them on the court, see how they gel, see how they pick up the defense. But, yeah, the potential is there for them to definitely be better. I just won't say they're better than like a 32 in what they lose, three <laughs> or four games at the end of the year. Yeah. But I guess the tournament loss brought them to four or whatever it was. But like 30-plus wins, conference championship, beat Michigan State to open the year, beat Wisconsin in the tournament. Like that you have to be really, really good to be better than that. I don't think they're only going to be like a three loss team. I also would expect or hope that the non-conference schedule is less crappy, which could lead to more losses, but a more fun season in some ways. And honestly, probably a better Ken Palm. Yeah, it's very true. So remember last off season, or I guess the story really started coming around 
I think during the John, when John Fanta wrote the, the long feature on the men's basketball team yeah. and it came up that they went on the Italy trip and Byington really used that as a, as a team chemistry piece. And that's when the team really took the step forward with Terrence as the leader with TJ Raekwon, all of those guys. I did ask Mark Freeman what he thought about that fact that there is yeah. no team chemistry, that this is a team that Spradlin has built out of thin air through the transfer portal. He did harp on the fact that he believes and fully expects Spradlin to do something similar. Might not be an Italy trip, but like the, I think June 6th is the date Mark Freeman said when they come together and start working out as a team that I think Spradlin is going to force them to create chemistry pretty quickly. Yeah, it's not crazy to think that they could get it to click, which would be exciting. I mean, the potential is there. The size is crazy. I think that's cool. The size is better than it was last year for sure. They're bigger. I think they're probably stronger, taller. It's an exciting roster that he's built. Like when when they hired Preston Spradlin, I was of the impression that he was going to bring like a Moorhead State player or two and then get sort of like the Luke Anderson mold. And I'm excited about Luke Anderson's addition, but some of those like unheralded guys for him to yeah. also add like multiple guys who have played meaningful minutes and power conferences. It's like, Oh, like you kind of landed an incredible hall if they can all gel. Can I speak recklessly here? And we're recording this podcast. This is on live stream. So yeah. this might get cut in post. I feel like the collective and NIL has played an impact in not only basketball, but football too. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not fully sold on the, uh, the retention model that we've heard. I, I think that there's stretching probably of what retention means, right? Where people are saying, I would assume if a player only has one year left, you wouldn't give them any NIL money because you don't need to retain them. Right. They're already at the school then they graduate. They're not going anywhere else mid season. Yeah. I wonder if that definition has been tweaked to be like, well, maybe somebody could come in over, over the next weeks before they've signed. So then there's retention that I don't know. Seems that way though. It's just very interesting because they have, they have signed some really big names where I'm not a hundred percent certain, but it, it seems like they've had offers elsewhere with money on the table. And maybe Spradlin's that great of a recruiter. Maybe maybe Bob Chesney is that great of a recruiter that he can sell them on the potential, especially if you have multiple years of eligibility, the potential of earning an NIL check mm -hmm. in 365 days. But it just I, seems yeah. like it is pretty impressive that, that they're able to do this right now under a retention-based collective. Not a lot of details about the collective, but I do think, yeah, it's – my guess is it's probably working in some capacity because I don't think you get either of these portal halls for free. I I 100% agree with that. And if the collective is working with these portal halls, would love to... I think that then makes me completely change my tune on how the collective is working. If, yeah, if, it, has, if it hasn't had an impact on the portal hall, if it has, massive success, rousing success. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. And that's why we were just hoping there'd be more information. But hey, yeah, the portal hall for football, portal hall for basketball, both very impressive. Basketball team stacked. The fact that they got Mark Freeman, who I kind of thought they wouldn't a few weeks ago based on the offers that you mentioned, right? Bandy, Wisconsin, Auburn, USC, we're saying, I mean, it's a lot of really good teams and and quality programs looking at him he, if he's at that level like he's gonna kill teams in the Sun Belt, you would think he killed teams in the ovc he's had a year off now a really interesting story too that i found out when talking with him his son now he has a yeah. son that's turning one next month we the first time that he's played in front of his son that's insane that's that gonna be fun be, yeah that's gonna be a fun little storyline to watch and he missed all of last season, and he said he used that time to kind of really learn the game from a coach's perspective. So now you got a point guard in Mark Freeman, who was like a coach on the floor. You can insert that cliche. And then you got Xavier Brown, who's literally a coach's kid. Mm -hmm. That backcourt's going to be lethal. And that brings me to this question. Projecting the JMU men's basketball rotation for next season. 
mainly I'm asking, do you think Mark Freeman and Xavier Brown are going to be a one-two combo package in the backcourt, both being the starters? Or do you think Xavier Brown and Mark Freeman are going to be a one-two punch with maybe Brown coming off the bench? I guess you could do you could do either. I think that's the challenge I've had trying to think of a starting five. You could convince me um, that they start Brown and Freeman. You could convince me that Brown comes off the bench. You could convince me um, that Hutchins Everett starts at center. You could convince me that our guy Ebenezer starts at center. You could convince me about just about anybody playing on the wings. I have no idea what it's going to look like. I just know that it's a lot deeper than I expected. Yes. It's a lot more talented than I expected. It's a lot bigger than I expected. And I don't envision anyone in the Sun Belt being really close to that level. Two, three, four weeks ago, there were 13 scholarships that had to be handed out. Yeah. We had no clue how this, this roster is going to shape up. Now, all of a sudden, you're running too deep at every position. You got two seven, six, eleven centers. You got three or four guys who can play the four. Three or four guys that can play the three, three guys who can play the two, three guys who can play the one. Of course, some of the, there's some overlap there with some of them. It's not saying at each position you're running that deep, but you could put Mark Freeman, Xavier Brown, Bryce Lindsay. I don't expect Red Thompson to yeah. to be necessarily in the mix. Well, likely red shirt, but in, in theory, he is four deep at the one. At the two, mm-hmm. you could probably go Xavier Brown and Justin Taylor. Yeah. Uh, Bryce Lindsey at the, at the two, at the three, you could go Luke Anderson, Justin Taylor, Eddie Ricks at the four. You could go Luke Anderson, Justin Taylor, Eddie Ricks. And at the five, you can go Ebenezer or Elijah. They're deep, man. They're a lot deeper than I thought they'd be. This looks like a fun. And Jarrell Roberson. I didn't even bring up Jarrell Roberson. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. It just kind of seems like they've leveled up coaching wise sometimes in a way that's like very surprising. We're like, I thought Mike Houston was killing it at JMU and he was, he was doing a great job. Eh. Decent argument that Signetti is just a better football coach. Yes. Yes. And a better recruiter and, and a better and a talent better. builder and a better, t- better talent evaluator. Houston so wanted they, to start Gage Maloney, a Bryant caliber starting back, starting so quarterback. That, so that, that's a pretty big <laughs> rise. You could argue. I think there's a solid case here, and I think Mark Byington's a darn good coach, that Spradlin is better and will have, like, a much higher ceiling. He's already – so he comes – I'll push back a little bit on this. Finish okay. your thought. But he I'll, comes to JMU having already taken a team to the NCAA tournament, which Byington last year is the first time he's ever done that. I think he can win at Vandy. It's also going to be hard to be, like, elite at Vandy. I don't know. Spradlin's only like 37. Like his ceiling could be crazy high. Just like I think Chesney's ceiling is way higher than whatever Signetti is going to be in part due to age, right? He's in the same spot three decades earlier. So my guess is he'll get to a power five or whatever and have a chance to exceed that. I just feel like they're killing the the hires. I think Spradlin has a chance to be a monster at JMU and then go on to some really big things. Not that Byington won't, but I don't maybe they upgraded, which is hard to hard to believe, hard to say, but Spryland seems like a really good coach. Football, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think they've upgraded with every hire. I'm going to push back on basketball for right now. Okay. Because all we see is a transfer portal and how he's able to recruit. Byington's style didn't lend itself to seven footers who might not be the most fleet of foot. And I know we always wanted bigs every single offseason. But when he got the type of bigs that he needed, they only lost three games and they won an NCAA tournament. That's true. If he can get that level of talent and big at Vandy, it could be interesting. Yeah, so I I just think Byington's style isn't, let's get two seven-footers and dominate with a slow pace. I think his style is like, let's get a 6'9 guy and let's play really quick at the mid-major level. It will be really interesting to see how that then projects to the SEC. Let's see how it goes. I'm just all in on Spradlin. I feel like this haul was beyond my wildest dreams. Let's. I'm excited because I don't. I don't see any way they finish outside like the top three in the Sun Belt. I'm shocked at this portal haul. Like I am genuine. I, I went into it thinking, okay, if we can get Eddie Ricks and Mark Freeman, mm-hmm. it's a win. 
No, they got Eddie Ricks, Mark Freeman, Power Five, Power Five, Power Five, D two All American. Yeah, they're big. a top two hundred recruit coming out of high school who's only played four games at Texas A and M. Brought back Xavier Brown, yeah, who I'm still very high on. I think an all conference first team caliber type of player. Now, if you can bring back maybe Raquan Horton, uh, oh. if they bring back Horton, it becomes a little bit unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of shocked we've heard nothing out of the Horton camp or the Amadi camp. Yeah, either one of those guys would be a fun, fun ad if, or I guess, fun retention, right? Retention based <laughs> collective. If they can keep one of those, it'd be crazy. Indeed. All right. Anything else on basketball? No, good team. I've never been, I don't know if I've ever been this excited leading into a season like in May. I was going to say, we haven't even technically finished the athletic year. Yeah. in which the basketball team just finished, and we're already excited for November. Could have some, depending on schedule, could have some just unbelievable home environments. I would love to see, you know, Green Bay on the schedule. I would like that one as well, yeah. Get some Doug Gottlieb action. That'd be huge. I, I think if JMU wins, continues to win consistently at home, that home environment is just going to get exponentially crazier. Yeah, there's potential there. A lot of potential. Potential. Get get Doug Gottlieb there. Bring UVA back. Get some F Tony mm. Bennett chance going, even though that made some people it. mad. That was awesome. Uh, who else can you get? Maybe. Love to see him play, you know, a VC of the world, Richmond's of the world. VC, maybe not Richmond's. They're, they're still trying to figure out everything that's going on with the CAA. Dukes of the world. Would love to get VCU for a home and home. The Andes of the world. Here's a question not on the outline that just popped in fannies of the world that just popped into my head that I want to get your take on real quick. Byington was anti two for ones, according to reports. He, he didn't want to sign those two for ones with maybe the VCUs, the George Masons, <sighs> maybe less so George Mason, but like those types of schools. I'm in the camp of I'm fine with a two for one. Just get them in your building. I don't hate it because it's better than playing bad that's, teams on the home and home. I think that's what I'm saying. Would you rather play Buffalo every year yeah, exactly. in November or would you rather do? And also Jamie has a huge alumni base in Richmond. So yeah. like the Siegel center wouldn't be just a purely. It would be cool. Beat. Yeah. So do you think Spradley, if you were the head coach and you went to VCU and you said, I want to play you this year. And they said two for ones only. Or, or two for one contract. So over the next three years, you're playing at Siegel Center twice. You're playing at Atlantic Union Bank Center once. Are you accepting that deal? I would try to do at least some of that, assuming it works financially, right? Because I guess there's some of that consideration. A home game is better than a away game in terms of obviously bringing in revenue from ticket sales, all that good stuff, and then also yeah. not having to pay travel costs. But yeah, I mean, if you can make it work, I think you've got to try to find a way to to have some of those huge games or bigger matchups that prepare your team for conference play. Because if we Recall, JMU didn't actually win the regular season title in the Sun Belt, <laughs> which, like, those are still cool. Obviously, you'd rather win the conference tournament and get to the NCAA tournament. But, like, winning the regular season is a good thing. Yeah, but, but it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter as much, but it's still – It doesn't won. matter at all. I think the, there's still value in it. If the NIT, the it doesn't take your, the reg- – no, the NIT, it doesn't matter. The NIT it doesn't give you an auto anymore. birth, but App State still made it thanks to a great – I think there's value in it. I think there's yeah. value in it, but but who knows? What was I going to say? Oh, when you said the two for one, I thought you were saying that Byington wouldn't do like two for one shot opportunities for reports. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, you're really, you're pissed about this. So you're bringing this up like, Will Spradlin do two for one. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Maybe he'll do both. <laughs> Why? What an interesting place you thought I was going with two for ones. But yeah, I'd like to see him. Play some yeah, when the, the schedule is it. bad again, it's going to be a real bummer with a team like this. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You know who doesn't have a bad schedule? Wow. Debatable. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie football has opening day in 109 days from when we're recording on May yeah. 14th, 2024. They'll be opening up the season down here in the Queen City against the Charlotte 49ers. The fighting Biff Pogies, some have called them. Couple big time transfer additions have come through. Christopher Fitzgerald, you sat down and talked to mm-hmm. over on our YouTube channel. Jakai Young, a defensive back transfer from Gardner Webb. They also added 
uh, Rashad Penny's brother, I believe. Yeah. Leave Brion Penny. Am I pronouncing? Am I back? I I'm the one that cut out. Oh hell yeah! My give me one second. It's a good day for me. Because my computer has been doing this recently. Mm -hmm. I plug it in, but it doesn't go to charging. It goes to like just the fact that it goes to like the battery adapter. So it just loses battery at a slower pace. That's weird. So sometimes I have to, let, there it goes. Okay. We are charging. And if I don't, if I don't catch it, it'll go like all the way down. Okay. I don't hear Brion Penny was the last thing I said. Did I pronounce that right? I think so. Okay. Cool. I'm ready whenever you, if you want to start it back up. Should I just say something about the transfers? The general transfer thing? Would that make yeah. sense in this? Okay. Yeah. It's been a portal haul for the Dukes. So yeah, they added obviously more receiver than I was expecting, to be honest with you, with Penny and and uh, Granger from ODU, but I feel like defensively, they're finally starting to take the strides we are looking for. Some defensive line help. Big time. And some secondary help at corner specifically. I'm excited for Chris Sheeran, the defensive back from UConn who just announced. Yeah, I had Chris Sheeran notifications on in the winter because I saw some mutual follows. I, I guess I failed to mention this in the podcast. Big loss for me. You did. I've been following Jordan Dunbar. This guy's retweeting his tape constantly. Tape, 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 retweet, 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 retweet. And then I get a notification that he's a Duke. And it was like, yes, yeah, so all this work paid off for me <laughs> of looking at his tape in my feed like once a day. But he's a good player. Started his career at Missouri. Yeah, started his career at Missouri. The Suffolk, Virginia native. Played his last two years at UConn. Kind of a fuzzy, interesting note. Sheeran... Mm -hmm played his freshman year for Missouri in 2019 mm -hmm. wasn't listed on their roster in 2020 or 2021 mm -hmm. transferred to UConn ahead of the 2022 season played 2022 and 2023 with the Huskies. However, on his pro football reference page, uh -huh. he has stats from Missouri in 2021. Huh. I wonder, did they just like clear part of his profile and not all of it? That may have that, that very well Occam's razor could have been it and probably mm -hmm. is it, but it's just very weird that like yeah. he doesn't exist in 2020 and 2021. That is odd, but he balled out for UConn in, uh, in Over 2022. Two yeah. 2022 and 2023. Good player. I'm excited about that addition. Yes, yeah, so now the, the defensive back room looks something like Chauncey Logan, uh -huh. Terrence Spence, mm -hmm. Ja'Kai Young, Chris Sheeran as your kind of corners. Yeah. Then your safety looks like Jacob Thomas, DJ Barksdale, Chase Regan, KJ Flo, Evan Spivey. Mm -hmm. Not bad. Safety still concern me a little bit, a little yeah. unheralded, a little young. Yeah. But the corners, it seems like they're doing – remember when we talked about last week about how the defensive line, you're not going to replace a Jalen Green with one guy, but you might be able to replace him with two or three guys? Yeah. Cornerbacks, it seems like they're not really going to replace a D'Angelo Pons, a freshman All-American, but you might be able to replace him in the aggregate. Yeah, I think Pons leaving is probably the best thing they ever have in a pro program, you know? All right. They're able to do the money ball thing, bring in some <laughs> DBs. No, I mean, that stinks. But, yeah, they have kind of filled the void with, like, a bunch of very capable corners. So I'm not that worried about the secondary. Still have my questions like you about safety, which is mostly, like, this huge bias I have against young players. Like, <laughs> last year, I'm sure, a corner, I was like, I don't know. They got young guys. And then, like, four weeks in, it's like, Dance Ponce is that guy. So I'm, there's probably going to be, like, a, like a, it could be week three. And I'm like, wow, Chase Regan's unbelievable. <laughs> 
So we'll see. They definitely have some young bodies there, just maybe not as much experience. I think the fear comes if you have like an injury to Jacob Thomas. Yeah. And then it's like, Ugh. or even Chauncey Logan. Yeah. So feels yeah, like, I have depth questions. feels like you're kind of teetering on the edge. It felt like women's basketball last year when Heaven Bristow wasn't playing and everyone had to like play a slightly different yes, role yeah. where if Chauncey Logan goes down, all of a sudden Ja'Kai Young might be your starter, your cornerback one. Right. Which he did play at, at Gardner Webb at the FCS level. He was the field corner, right? Not the boundary corner. Uh, who could say? He mentioned it in your interview. That's why I asked. <laughs> I think he, I can't remember what he said. I want to say he said he liked field because it was like, covering yeah. more and yeah. and just so everyone is aware because i just learned what field and boundary corner were at the midway point of last season just because i had never seen that terminology field corner is typically your cornerback one and it's abbreviated fcb and he's the guy who's playing with more of the field on his side so you have the hash marks yeah if you're playing if you're looking at the game if they're on the far hash, he's going to play the one with there's more field between the receiver and the sideline. Boundary corner is cornerback two playing the receiver closer to the sideline. Yeah, the idea is that your best corner can handle like having to cover a guy in more space. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, you talked about going up against number ones and even like following them. So I imagine he was he was talking field. Yeah, but he's he's big time. He's got game. They have a bunch of guys who are really talented. I think. um Mans too, the the main in Colorado transfer is really interesting because he's listed as a linebacker, but he's essentially a defensive edge. Um, he's going to rush off the edge. That's what he did at Maine. He's really explosive. Didn't play a lot at Colorado, but add sort of more in the pass rush department. Obviously, Fitzgerald goes in the middle and I think has a good chance to to play there. I like the defense. I like the defense. I do too. I like the defense a lot. I'm very interested in the wide receiver additions they've had, though, in this spring portal. Didn't feel like wide receiver was a need, but they went out and got a Marion Granger and Breon Penny. And they both, like, were used last year at their schools. Like, so they're, they had some catches. I mean, like, almost 300 yards receiving for Penny in an offense that absolutely sucked at throwing the ball. He's got some game, which based on the room is very confusing. It's like, I don't know. They feel like they have a million receivers who could all play. Also very weird because Penny is the brother of NFL running back Rashad Penny, who was one of the greatest running backs in San Diego state history. And Penny was at San Diego state and decided to transfer away. Maybe he didn't fit with the new scheme because what they brought in Sean Lewis who was at Kent State and then Colorado and had the weird firing as the offensive coordinator there um runs like that up tempo spread thing yeah where they score a gazillion points so I'm guessing if you're a receiver maybe you just didn't fit quite into the scheme because it that, seems that like be a it. pretty yeah. fun scheme to play in. <laughs> like I don't know if I would leave sunny California to to like not run that scheme but uh maybe he fits better in, in what Chesney and Kennedy have planned yeah, so Penny should be a, a factor, should be breaking into that rotation. So the returners, Taji Hudson, Omarion Dollison, you got Yamir Knight, uh -huh. transfers in Cam, or the winner transfer stuff, Cam Ross. Yeah. You got Dylan Williams, a freshman stud who stood out the spring game. Do you think we're buying into the Dylan Williams hype a little bit too much and he may not actually play? That's very possible, based on some of the better additions. <laughs> that, that's extremely possible they just have so many options but i guess the good news is you have some some good depth where like if you do have an injury to a guy like taji hudson or uh ross granger and, and penny can kind of fill into some of those roles where penny's got a bunch of size that's similar to hudson so if hudson's your guy he gets banged up you slide in you know penny or williams or whoever so a lot of competition there i mean the if the offense isn't like top three scoring in the sun belt <laughs> I don't know what's happening because they have what seemingly every piece that you would possibly want. Yeah, they're kind of disgusting in their right? skill like, positions. The line's good. Line returns a decent amount, and they added some nice portal additions. Running back is just <laughs> running than back last is, year, like by far. Yeah, like it's not even close. 
<laughs> not at all. Quarterback, you would think, could be similar. Dylan Slight Morris. step back, maybe. Yeah. Just based off of the fact that you're replacing the conference player of the year. <laughs> so, but hey, how much of that was scheme? How much of that was McLeod? We're going to find out this year at Texas State. I think McLeod's pretty good. But I think McLeod is a very good quarterback. Despite Kurt Zignetti's comments. <laughs> And then receivers loaded. So, like, if you're not scoring a lot of points when you should have a passing game, should have a running game, that's those are the two games you're looking for on offense. <laughs> well, football should be fun. How do you have any? I mean, is there any is there any possible way they lose more than three games? Yes. You think so? All right. Is it that time? Is it that time of the podcast? If they're worse than nine and three, something went wrong. The schedule okay. kind of sucks. We kind of do this at random throughout the off season where we just both pull up the, well, well one of us pulls up the schedule. I'll do yeah. it this time. Okay. And we'll just throw the games at each other and say win or loss. Okay. At Charlotte to be our right, spring game. Dub. Spring game was a dub. Yeah. Close <laughs> one, but a dub. It was a close one. 30, yeah. 29. <laughs> Uh, at Charlotte to open the season up. Win. Okay. So I think win too. However, I think this game's going to be a lot better than JMU fans are expecting. Charlotte added some boys. Charlotte added some boys. Biff Pogey in his second year as head coach might have figured <laughs> some stuff out. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> like wear a shirt maybe? And JMU fans are under underappreciating how good the 49ers might actually be this year. No. I don't okay. think so. Because because he wore a cutoff tee and his team sucked. Okay, fair. Like did they add good players? I don't know. They added know. a Florida transfer quarterback. Oh that like, is he good? He's better than what they had last year. I have my doubts, but yeah, maybe they will be a little bit improved, but I, I say all that I'm saying it's a win. I just don't think it's going to be like a 50 to seven win. I think it sure, might be more sure. like a 31 27 type of win. Oh my God. That'd be horrifying. If they lose to well, what I'm say- it's a well, meltdown for me. It's like hot seat. It, I, I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to prepare because I think this game might, it might be closer. You than think what Char- everyone- Charlotte could be a bowl team? Yes. Okay. I think bet Charlotte spread. I'm excited for that one. Yeah, if they if they lose that game, that feels like nightmare scenario. No, it's not. Uh, Gardner like Webb. That's a win. Kai Young revenge game. Kai Young revenge game. At North Carolina. That's a win. I'm saying that's a loss. Yeah, bye week coming into it. Yeah, I think Dylan Moore is going to give a pregame speech that's remembered for decades that gets the guys amped, and I think they win. They're three and zero. The nation is talking about them. People were saying, oh, my God, should they go to Harrisonburg for game day against Ball State? No, they're not saying that. People are saying it. But then, okay, then Ball State home family weekend. I think I think because of the family atmosphere within the program, they went on family weekend. I think they went because it's Ball State. Okay. Then at ULM, that's a dub, right? That's a win, yeah. Home against Coastal. If we're going just based off of history, that's a win. Coastal got loot, so that's a good get for them uh, in the portal. Who's loot? He is a defensive back who played at Texas A&M Commerce, whose name I don't remember, but Twitter handle is loot. And he visited JMU and Coastal. He's going to Coastal. Had an interception last year against ODU. That's a great get, but Jamie still wins that game Thursday night. Streamers will be going crazy. Feels like it could be a snow game, one of those famous Jamie snow games. And I'm looking forward to it. All right. Love the sarcasm. <laughs> At Georgia Southern, the last time the Dukes went to Statesboro, Georgia, bad things happened. Probably not a snow game, but there is a mini buy. Mini win. buy? Win. I think it's a win two in that spot. Southern Miss home homecoming. Dub win. Yeah, they lost Frank Gore Jr. It's going to be really hard to rebuild a program after losing such a key player like that. Home against Georgia State win. Dumpster fire win. At ODU 
That's going to be a brutal game win. I think that's going to be an L. <sighs> App State on the road. Win. You are looking at it this with way too much purple colored glasses. I think that's a loss. Uh huh. Then Marshall. I think that's a win. I think they run the table. Have you seen this portal hall? Oh my god! You ge- like genuinely going game by game. I've because I have them at three losses. I have them at yeah one. I have them at three. That's losses. the floor. Nine and three is the floor. It's in play. I think they might do it. This team is loaded. I'm gonna be. Anything less than nine, I find very disappointing. I think 10, 10 is extremely doable. I think 11 and one is like your realistic. And I think 12 and 0 is your minor stretch goal. I can't you, tell if you're being serious or not. No, you got the best running game in the Sun Belt on paper. You've got a veteran quarterback who could be a dog with a nice receiving core. Also could not be a dog because they are offering other quarterbacks who have starting experience. Yeah, he's a dog. You have a defensive line that feels way deeper than last year with a lot of talent on those. Yeah, edges. but their ceiling is nowhere near what they're. I don't know. They got a lot of, a lot of athletes on those edges. Then you're yeah, looking they're going to have another 20 sack guy. No, but they'll, everyone will have six and there's eight of them. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. That's still for somebody less than like, <laughs> just what Jalen Green had. Well, he also wasn't a 20 sack guy. He was projecting to get 20 sacks. <laughs> Sorry, it was like a 19 sack guy. 15 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, they're loaded on the defensive line. Linebacker, Jacob Dobbs. Enough said. Secondary's improving. Some of the freshmen are going to be stars. Special teams are actually going to be good because they have a coach who cares about it. That's a good point. <laughs> what a nice change that is. Instead of just like, yeah, if our punt returner can catch a punt, that's a huge win for us, which is what they somehow were, have convinced fans of like three years ago, which is insane. Like, oh, he's a great fair catch guy. What does that mean? Yeah, after D'Angelo Amos, they just decided, let's just put a guy who knows how to wave his hands. They're going to be explosive on specials. Chesney's already talking about going on like summer boating trips to Bondum or rafting. (laughs) Boating makes it seem like they're like on yachts boozing, but they're already going on rafting trips. They're going on below deck Mediterranean. (laughs) So they're going to be bonded. They're going to have this culture. Their two hardest games are in the same state, which I like for them. They get a bye week before. (laughs) They just don't have to travel that much. Like their travel is very easy. Their schedule is very favorable. They have a bye week before UNC. The ODU App State stretch scares me. I'll be honest. ODU here. App State Marshall stretch. Not scared of Marshall. I feel like Brett Griffiths, his brother's on the other team. He's going to get enough intel. <laughs> At Thanksgiving that year. At Thanksgiving, yeah. That he figures out sort of their game plan. They get it to Chesney. That'll be. I love that when people ask that. There will be like somebody who played on a former team. It'd be like. Like they'll play Gardner Webb and they'd ask like Chesney, like, are you picking Ja'Kai Young's brain on this one? Like, no. He just watches the film and they come up with a game plan. You think he's going to the like former player guy? <laughs> there was a lot of that with UVA. They'd be like, You asking this UNC transfer a lot about this? No, not really. Like, I'm letting him prepare for the game. <laughs> God. Drives me crazy. But I actually think they could go 12 and 0. Okay. Fair. I if think they, it was okay. more what's what's your riot level like what what's the record they would have to go for you to be like pissed like on this podcast calling for chesney's job Uh, maybe not calling for his job but just like fuming and having like people having legit doubts of like wait i'm 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 getting panicked at four wins riot level sets in at five (laughs) <laughs> if they're not like seven and if they go seven and five with like reasonable health brain explosion over here. Yeah. That, that, like if they stay healthy and they don't like lose Dylan they Morris lose, like, for Morris, like all yeah. of October. Sure. If they get to October with more than two losses, panic button is <laughs> like is, they only beat Gardner Webb. No, no, like, so through say, October? Through October. So through yeah, they it. lose three. Okay. 
So if they lose three, that's Charlotte, Gardner Webb, UNC, Ball State, ULM, Coastal, Georgia Southern, Southern Miss. If they lose three or more of those games, I'm not hitting the panic button, but I'm taking it out of my drawer and placing it on my desk. I'm getting ready to hit it. Because then if you drop any in... I mean, because then that last four-game stretch... If you lost three games in that first two months of the season, you could realistically go one and three over that last four game stretch. Yeah. The November, I think, will be a, a bit of a challenge for him for sure. I uh, you know what? Here's this is my worst case scenario for the year. You're undefeated going into November. All of the hype. You're nationally ranked, highest ranking in program history. You play Georgia State. Glow Fiber's the game sponsor, man. You know what Glow Fiber brings to the program. Mm -hmm. Fiber optic connectivity throughout the Harrisonburg Valley. Why is there a game sponsor for a road game? Is that because they sponsor the Royal Rivalry? Yes. Okay. So you then beat Georgia State. Hype is even more heightened. Mm Mm-hmm. Worst case scenario is then you lose at ODU at App State and then beat Marshall because if you lo- lose yeah, those two yeah. games, you're out of the college football playoff. Yeah, you could probably afford one and still put yourself firmly in contention. I just, with the roster on paper, the coaching staff on paper that's supposed to be just legit, the fan base, like, I would consider it not a colossal failure, but like, <laughs> I don't if they I don't know <laughs> if they lose two home games I would be stunned if they lose one I'll be moderately disappointed like I think with the schedule the home games are Gardner Webb Ball State Coastal Carolina Southern Miss Georgia State and Marshall it's a horrible home slate it, you shouldn't lose a home game to be honest with the team they have like if they're healthy I don't think they should lose a home game and then you're looking at six road games Four and two, five and one. That seems seems doable. A lot of it kind of hinges on uh, the North Carolina game. Because if you can get through that one, you've created a huge margin for error. If you don't get through that one, you won't have a P5 win on your resume. And then you really don't have any margin for error in terms of the college football playoffs. So that's a huge, huge early season game. I agree. All right. You ready for listener questions before we kind of oh, wrap we things up? Questions. We do. All right. Listener questions. Coming first from Tyler Reskovac. Are you more excited to see the revamped football team or the revamped basketball team? Mm. Which one do you think will be making the louder noise during their season? This is a great question. This is a fantastic question. My answer will be weird. I'm going to say I'm more excited for the revamped basketball team um, in like a hipster pretentious way that people like say we are on message boards, but I'm more excited for it because I think I don't think they'll have the same early season hype. Cause I don't think they're going to grab like a Michigan state quality win necessarily. I think they're just going to be really steady and really good. And we're going to know they're really good. They're gonna be a ton of fun to watch. I think they'll play well. I think they'll be really good. Whereas I think the football team, if they start the way I think they can, is going to have like crazy headlines. It'll still be a lot of fun. I just think like basketball is going to be a more casual, chill, fun team that if you do watch them every game or every couple of games, watching them develop, I think will be so much fun. I am more excited to watch the revamped basketball team too. I am in total agreement. I'm more excited for football season just because football is yeah. my favorite sport but I am more excited to see what basketball does with that revamped roster. 1000%. Which one do you think will be making the louder noise during their season? I think it's football because like you said, if football opens up five and Oh, six and Oh, they're going to be ranked 18th in the country where if JMU opens up undefeated, like they did last year, it's going to take a lot to get them ranked pretty high. Yeah. You could also, I just like the, the way it works is like the, you know, Basketball is probably not making a ton of noise unless they're winning games in March where like if you're in the college football playoff discussion, that noise can be pretty, pretty hectic. 
especially when they start releasing the college football playoff yes. rankings, like in week yeah. six, and you're if like, you're the highest. Whoa, yeah. we would be in. Yeah. <laughs> if it, if it's easy, that's what I'm saying too about like you could be like nightmare scenario is being undefeated through Georgia State because that's so you think you're you have, in for like a month, yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you drop two of the three, and you're not even in the top twenty five at the end, and you're like, no, kind of like the lawsuit. <laughs> kind of like the lawsuit. Um, this is from depressed Duke dog at Duke mm. dogs burner. What do you think Signetti's halftime adjust adjustments will be at halftime? <laughs> I'm really glad he, he clarified that it was halftime. Let me start over. What do you think Signetti's halftime adjustments will be down 60 to the Dukes when NCAA 25 releases? <laughs> That's a great question from just a <laughs> sick, sick jammy mind. It's just a, you get the game. The very first thing you do is go into play now, not even road to glory. You go into play now, like you're playing your friend when you were six, and you're like, all right, Indiana, JMU, not the black jerseys, put on J. Let's go 15 minute quarters, rookie mode. Let's go. <laughs> let's run this shit up. Uh, this is from Roger Smith. At Roger Smith 13. It's been a great JMU sports season, but it seems every team, football, basketball, softball, lacrosse, has ended its season with a heartbreaking loss. Could that impact recruiting? His kind of vibe is, i.e., can't beat nationally ranked opponents. Um, I don't think it would. I don't think so either because you're playing those games. That's and, sort of, yeah, that's a good point. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're at the mid-major level, being able to play ranked opponents is almost just as good as beating them. Because if you're a recruit seeing that for lacrosse, for example, you're seeing them play all of those ranked opponents in non-conference. You're seeing them make it to the NCAA tournament. You're sitting there as a recruit saying, I can help them win the games they lost. They're putting the, they're not afraid to schedule tough opponents. They believe in this program. I can step in and help take them to that next level. Yeah. Obviously winning would right be help. beneficial if you win like a national championship in basketball as a mid major, certainly it helps. But I think the thing that's worth noting is that like new coaches for football and men's basketball have both recruited phenomenally well through the portal. So I, I don't think it makes a big difference. Like, I don't think anyone is um, like a uh, Eric O'Neill from Long Island is not passing up a chance to play for JMU in front of 25,000 fans with a legit chance to contend for a college football playoff berth because they lost to Air Force last year in a bowl game with a different coach. Like, it doesn't really matter. I think some of it, especially when the coaches change um, softball, I think recruiting might get hurt more by the fact that they're not playing in regionals when they're losing. Right. I think like losing to Louisiana in a conference tournament is different than losing to Duke in the NCAA tournament after winning a game. Uh, that is a perfect segue into Roger Smith's second question. Softball has had tremendous challenges, which include moving to a tougher conference and the tragedy. In light of all of this, is it fair to say it's been hard trying to take advantage of the 2021 Women's College World Series appearance and that 2025 needs to be a better season? It's a good question. I would say yes. I think softball, you probably got to put it into context a little bit, right? Where the fact that they had some of those players like Odyssey Alexander and Kate Gordon and Sarah Jubis was uh, part of that was stemming from the fact that COVID hit in 2020. So they were going into their last year and they were, they were like fine to start that year, but they weren't crazy. They had a whole nother year to like stay in practice when they probably should have had like jobs so they, they stayed another year, got even better. Like the team they returned with in 2021 was insane. And it was even better than what it would have been in 2020. So COVID like weirdly probably helped softball, just the timing of it and returning some of those players. So they get all those good players back. They make this magical run leaning on Odyssey. It's really hard to find like unheralded all-time program greats like three times in a row, like Jalen Ford, not highly recruited. Megan Good, not highly recruited. Odyssey Alexander, not highly recruited. And all turned out to be like exceptional players. Finding that consistency is very, very hard. Um, so like sustaining that was probably not feasible. At the same time, it's definitely disappointing to be like a consistent regional team, 
make a women's college world series and then go three consecutive seasons without fielding a team that goes to a regional. I agree. I, I think 2025 is a pretty big year for softball. Yeah. I think uh, a seat might be getting warm. With Mark Freeman on the squad, what do we think the starting five? This is from Zachary Baker. What do you think the starting five looks like on opening night? Just real quick, rattle me off what your starting five is. I'll do Freeman Brown. I'll put Justin Taylor at the three, Rick's at the four, and we'll do Ebenezer at the five today. <laughs> today. <laughs> you just, just switch it up. I'm going to go Freeman. Freeman. Taylor, Anderson, Ricks, and Elijah. Xavier Brown, six man. I like that. I do Anderson starting is cool too with the shooting ability. Yeah. You also got AJ Smith in there. I always forget. Yeah. AJ Smith. Gosh, their bench rotation will be good. If they do get Horton back, they could just do two separate fives. Which they won't need to do because they don't play at a high tempo. <laughs> They'll be so fresh. Man, it'll be <laughs> disgusting. All right. For Bennett. Oh, wait, wrap up. Uh, real quick, lacrosse, their yeah. season comes to a, a tough end. 17-7 to seven loss in the second round of the NCAA tournament at Maryland. Don't think the sky's fallen on this one. Some I think weird reactions after the game, right? There were some interesting reactions. This team will be back. This team is very good. They have the necessary players. Epke's coming back. You are losing some really solid talent in uh, Peterson and Knobloch. But, I mean... They've done it before. They're going to do it again. You talk about we we reload, we don't rebuild. I mean, that has been the most true for lacrosse. They might take a slight step back, but they should be an NCAA tournament contender year in and year out. Oh, and the American Athletic Conference got worse with Florida <laughs> leaving, so they yeah. should be getting automatic qualifiers by winning that tournament every year. You would think so. I think one of the things, softball and lacrosse-wise, that people – um kind of overhyped sometimes is like the program history where JMU's like standard in lacrosse, uh, especially recently has been making the NCAA tournament. Uh, that's sort of been a tradi traditional thing. And then like winning a game very recently. A tradition unlike any other. That's right. They're not like winning national championships most years or playing in national championship games most years. So like, when people are like, oh, my God, what a step back. It's like, well, not really. They just had an incredible high, just like the softball team is not accustomed to making the Women's College World Series. That was an incredible high. I think what you're looking for with, like, every team is a baseline, like, success of, hey, did you get in the tournament? And lacrosse consistently gets in and wins. Yeah. Like, it's hard to, hard to hate on that. I did buy into the hype to start the season, though. Me too. I thought they were national champion. And I think that might have been the issue. We all bought into the hype and then got burned as the season went on. And we realized, oh. I know Frank bought into it too. Oh, Frank's up on the bed. <laughs> I was like, Frank, what's he doing? Yeah, he's been sleeping behind me the whole time. Uh, and in other news, JMU will host the 2025 Sunbelt Conference Championships for outdoor track and field. Any takes on that? That's cool. Awesome. For Bennett Conlin, I'm Jack Fitzpatrick. Thank you so much for tuning into the JMU Sports News Podcast presented by Bet Online. As the offseason is here, things might change a little bit in terms of when we're streaming, when we're recording. Our schedule becomes a little less predictable throughout the offseason. So just keep it locked to our YouTube, to our Twitter, our Facebook, Instagram. We'll keep it all updated in terms of when we're recording, when we're live streaming, everything like that. But if you subscribe to our podcast, wherever mm -hmm. you're listening, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, somewhere else, just hit subscribe and you'll never miss a podcast. And while you do that, be sure to leave a comment, like, rate, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. So I'm Jack Fitzpatrick. That's Ben Conlon. This has been the Jamie Sports News Podcast. We'll see you guys next week. See ya. Thank you for listening to Believe. 
You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube. You know when you're listening to a true crime story that has an unbelievable plot twist that makes you stop in your tracks? That's what our podcast, People Are the Worst, brings you with each episode. I'm Rachel. And I'm Rebecca. We're identical twins who love true crime cases that make you say, didn't see that coming, and we hate the people responsible for them. Listen to People Are the Worst now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.